Dark Side Phil. DSP has announced that he's doing a documentary with Mike Clum. So if most of you are aware, I haven't watched it yet. I need to actually do a live stream and do a reaction to it. But Mike Clum did a really amazing documentary on Boogie 2998. And it's one of the best documentaries I think I've seen. I've seen bits of it here and there. Very well produced. And it did a really good job of sort of, you know, putting, laying it bare just how much of an awful person Boogie is through his own words and through interviews with other people in and around him and stuff. And it kind of just showed just and i think the other side of why people like locale so much and why they can't you know stop watching these absolute degenerates absolute deplorable people basically um you know turn their life into a living hell in flipping real time so it was quite nice to see so with dark side phil being the premier locale and somebody that i actively root against and and a, a demonstrably irredeemably awful person he's also somebody that is incredibly um i would say adverse to having interviews and sitting down with people the last time that he did do one with side scrollers it turned into being one of the biggest mistakes of his streaming career um in terms of he wanted to maybe rewrite the narrative and show a different side of himself and have that be the place where people could go to if they had any questions about him him and whatever it may be and it ended up being one of the worst mistakes of his streaming career because it laid bare what an awful person he is and how often that he lies so with this documentary most likely it'll be the same thing for some reason dsp thinks it's going to actually do him the world of good but i have a feeling it's actually going to do him the world of hurt if the documentary is as extensive expansive detailed and involves the lord's different voices it will actually be one of the worst mistakes he makes if he actually goes through with it but for some reason dsp just is as addicted to drama um as everybody else is out there even though he says he's not and he just can't help himself so this is dsp announcing he's working with mike clum after mike clum already leaked the information to review tech usa let's see what he has to say yeah. you know it's serious when he wears his black top you know black top is the black begging t-shirt this is his announcement this is like his um apple fucking you know presentation right this is his steve jobs outfit he means business that everyone wants to hear about all right and then we'll get to shout outs and q a after that all right all right so ladies and gentlemen here's the deal because the rumors have already hit the internet. There's already rumblings. There's already information out there. So I am here to so basically shaking. clarify everything, to clear the air, and to let you know exactly what is going on. All right? Go on, tell us then. Last year was a very drama-filled, nonsensical year for me. Against my will and against my wishes. Correct? We, I think we can all agree. Last year, there was a lot of very negative talk about me on the internet, in some cases from really big YouTubers. Right? <laughs> Now, in some cases, being very transparent here, when I got criticized by Moist Critical, and he was like, dude, I can't believe he's saying the things he's saying on his streams to his viewers about income and stuff like that. It seems very, you know, disrespectful. He doesn't seem like he has any gratitude. You know, you can't say that kind of stuff. That resonated with me. It struck a chord. No, it correct? didn't. No, it didn't resonate with you. You didn't. You continue to beg. You continue to do all the things that you said you wouldn't do. And if anything, it was quite embarrassing that you needed another grown man to tell you that begging and pleading for you with your fans to pay you in tips so that you could pay for your groceries and take your horse of a wife out for dinner once a week is not the right thing to do. Is disgusting, is deplorable, and will never be acceptable and will never be okay. People will always clown you for it and rightfully so that's a disgusting thing to do and to need somebody an adult to tell you that is really beyond any kind of explanation i agreed with him after watching myself back you know this is from like the fall of 2022 okay after watching myself back <clears throat> that stuff I was and he's like, 41 years right. old by the way he's absolutely right he's 41 I years old sometimes get so full of 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 emotion whether it's fear you know, because of finan finances and stuff like that, or it could be many different Which things. Which you got yourself you know, in trouble with. Fighters, all these things. Whenever I get full of emotion, I tend to just go off the cuff and say things that I probably should not publicly say, right? Um, and I should be called out for it, rightfully. However, I felt that at that point, there were too many people who had only heard the negative and had no idea about the positive about me. You know, obviously. What is the positive about DSP, though? What is the positive? He's the king of hate. 
you're the king of hate. What is positive about DSP, really? Outside of maybe his ability to always be streaming, right? He streams like six days a week and shit, right? He's always on here fucking begging and pleading for money. You know, he makes a, a good amount of money. What was it, 100k a year from begging and pleading people and, you know, playing games terribly. But what else is good about him as a person? Like, good. He treats his fans like shit. He manipulates them. He cheats. He lies. This person's awful. If I'm here after 15 years and I have a community who watches me every day, likes my content and supports it, I'm doing something right. All right? I wouldn't still be here. If I no, but you're not, though. That's the thing, though. You're, you're not doing something right. If you actually look at the details and you break it down, I think if you look at the piece of piece um, tips tracker and shit, you will notice that for most of the time, he has a, he has a goal of achieving, what, $150 per each stream. He does two streams per day. And for the most part, the majority of the money that he gets is always from the same f two to three whales are the ones that are basically propping up his entire existence. And those same whales are also the same people who buy, um, who kind of have loads of sock accounts and do all these fucking, um, what you call it, buy all these gifted memberships for people on his channel also. So essentially his whole entire career is supported by the charity and generosity of maybe five people in total are the ones that are funding him completely. So he's kind of similar a lot to those kind of cam girl type people out there where he has these benefactories, these kind of, you know, these people who are essentially paying him to perform every single time. There's only five of them for the most part. And the rest of it also just manipulation and shit. And he wastes most of that money on fucking WWE championships, right? WWE champion, sorry. That fucking gambling, you know, um, gotcha game that he plays, the mobile game he plays. So the money that he makes, he could easily be okay with. He could pay his bills. He could be okay, clear his debts. But he wastes most of it on gambling and obviously on drinking loads of booze, being a former alcoholic, make it make sense. I wasn't doing something, right? There's people who are here for a good positive reason. And sure. I felt like it wasn't fair because... These big YouTubers who always name drop me never examine that half of it. They only examine the negative because that's what gets thrown in their face by the toxicity of YouTube. That's how YouTube works. Promote the toxic. Push the... But that's a funny thing, though. If he actually had fans, where are the fans that are making, like, fun, positive content about DSP? Why don't those people come forward? Where are those fans? If you actually have, if you're actually doing some good, why aren't there people out there pushing some of the nice and good things that you say? Why is it only the negative is getting pushed? Maybe because you're negative. That could also be the reason. Maybe. Who knows? Negative forward, right? <clears throat> and so I, I said, if you're going to talk bad about me, why not interview me? Correct? Not really. They don't need then to. Why not just talk to me directly? They don't need to. If, I felt like if someone would just have a conversation with me to see that I'm a real guy, I'm not just some ass. The f it's happened already on side scrollers. That's a funny thing, though. It happened already on side scrollers. What of the guy on side scrollers had no idea who DSP was. The other guy did. They kind of, you know, they went, you know, they go back in time and shit. They just hang out and do all that geeky stuff. Cool, whatever. But one of the guys on the side scrollers interviews had no idea who DSP was. And just through talking to him on the live stream interview, he deduced that DSP was everything that the detractors said he was. He was a liar. He was a scammer. He was a manipulator later right he was able to deduce that during the fucking live stream interview so everything that he's saying happened already in side scrollers interview but he thinks it's going to be a different story with mike club it's going to be funny to see to be fair i want to see it mostly for the interview footage of him at home and stuff i want to see that waddle i've been so desperate to see how he walks from the back and stuff because I've, I've seen him do he's got that kind of waddle that he does he almost looks like a bit of like a penguin so i would love to see that in actual 4k asshole who you see the negative highlights of, but I'm actually just a real person, perhaps you'd think a little differently, all right? Mm, probably so not. I presented that to the internet, and basically, the only people who contacted me were drama brokers and people who were looking to boost their own presence on YouTube. You know, it wasn't like a Moist Critical who reached out. Yeah, exactly. Big up, Netwatcher. Exactly. I honestly can't believe that this guy has his the fan base. It's funny, isn't it? how the fuck does this little scumbag rat like just get people stupid enough to send him money but that's the thing though you know what dsp has he has that legacy fan base which is quite important when it comes to places like youtube like that ability to like 
I think I saw a video of one of the guys, I forgot it was, some street fighter dude, I forgot his name. He mentioned it. He mentioned how, like, I think somebody asked him a question of, like, oh, how do I build a fan base? How do you go from streaming to one person to streaming to loads of people? Like, how do you build it up and stuff? And he was basically, like, he got luck. He got lucky because he got in early. Getting in early allowed him to kind of have a built-in fan base that he was obviously able to take from videos to live streaming. Um, and I think the same is for DSP. Like, he got in YouTube early enough that he was one of the few people out there doing it. Like content creation back when YouTube first started wasn't that common. Not everybody had maybe access to cameras or whatever it may be. So it wasn't as easy and as accessible as it is now. And there wasn't a lot of competition. So he was able to kind of get in there. And obviously he hasn't stopped streaming or recording since then. So if you just stayed consistent, if you just stay consistent, and again, he's somebody that's incredibly financially irresponsible, incredibly dumb, incredibly reckless and irresponsible, all this pig, all pig headed, all this stuff but he's still been able to maintain his you know footing online because he just stayed the course he didn't drop off he didn't just take a break or go on sabbatical he just kept churning out shit content after shit content because he started off early enough people just hang around that's basically the reason why he's still around and obviously he has whales that will support him but it's pretty crazy when you actually look at the numbers he legitimately has five people that are propping up his entire existence it's pretty wild to think that to be fair out to me and said yeah let's do an interview it was like review tech usa you know oh let's do an interview no you already every day name drop me because you don't make your own content you just make drama and i'm also certain as well that he actually has legit fans i don't buy this notion that everybody that supports dsp is a dent head or something like on that line obviously there are some but i think the majority of his fans are actually regular people who just are long-term fans like it's pretty difficult like i think people dismiss how difficult it is to stop being a fan of somebody if they've provided you with like hours and hours of free content over the last however many years it is you know consistently you're always going to get i don't know how many hours worth of content per week from this redact and it kind of occupies your background space and allows you to do the chores around your home maybe do work whatever it may be all those things are things that people are not going to willingly put to one side because it's hard to replace it with something else if you if you only listen to dsp for the majority of your life in content wise where else are you going to get that content to replace it you have to actively go and find it and stuff that takes time that's long so it makes sense to just like hold on to him you know because why not even though he's a redax why not he's you know you've known him for this long anyway why drop him now and you name drop me for drama purposes you have no content of your own i'm not going to give you more free content you're out of your mind you see <laughs> i wanted to have a real conversation with someone and it didn't happen right mm. <clears throat> so then fast forward to march mm. and what happened was completely unrelated to anything in that realm of discussion. Side Scrollers was a new podcast that was relaunching on the internet. It was a podcast that was run by Stuttering Craig, someone who in the past, over a decade ago, I had great deal. In a I would go into a convention. That fucking voice. In a piece. as a guest. Yeah. I was at the height of my YouTube popularity. Yeah. And it was his convention. He had me there as a guest. Before then, I'd actually hung out with this guy at, a, at a, another convention, MAGFest. Um, I was a fan of their website 15 years ago, screwtack.com okay. and stuff like that. So he had reached out to mm -hmm. me and said, hey, I know we haven't talked in years, but we're looking for guests for our show. Yeah. And I said, I'll be a guest. Why not? And I saw their show and their show is a variety show. Well, mm. <clears throat> their show was a variety show where they would talk about games and news. Now it's not anymore. Now they've actually used my interview as a platform to change their show and get popularity. But we'll what's, what's the problem with that? He think, he likes to think he's such a big deal. You're not that big of a deal, bro. People will, and and it's not even a good big deal. People are literally waiting for you to just fail and to fall on your fucking ass and to have to be brought back down to reality. That's why I look. That's why I wait and w watch you for most of the time. Point and laugh and wait for the comic retribution to come around because for some reason, even though he's you know he has been quote unquote cancelled in some respects, he hasn't really faced the true consequences of his action he's been able to get away with murder for a long 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 time so you kind of keep watching hoping that he's going to get his kind of just deserves so the way he kind of likes to spin it as if people are like watching him because he's some sort of big deal or something it's just it's a strange angle to go about it and what's the problem with them changing their angle of their show because of your sh your interview and because of how that kind of maybe changes the direction of what they're doing what's the, what's the problem with that
We'll talk about that later. That's what regular people actually do. They listen to their audience. They see what's happening. They see the fucking, you know, reception they're getting from people and they kind of adjust course. They don't just be pig headed and do what you do for fucking a million years. So basically, I, I say, I'll be a guest on your show. But okay. But then they completely changed the deal. Uh -huh. The deal was originally, I'm just going to be a guest. We'll talk about a variety of topics. It'll be a fun show. Then it becomes. No one wants you to be a guest. On, you know what? I'd actually, I, I would actually like to see DSP on a podcast, though, to be fair. Like talking to other humans. Because I think he's so deranged. He's so dumb and clueless about the world. And he's so. Um, living in his own bubble and secluded from everyone it would actually be quite entertaining to see him talk to other people like and have to have back and forth with people have people call him out on his bullshit i'd actually like to see that but most people wouldn't want to do it because he's insufferable right and he's fucking a headache to talk to right like even that side scrollers interview by the end of it those guys were legitimately exhausted because he just does something to your brain talking to somebody like this on a you know at, at a long enough basis but i actually wouldn't mind seeing him on a panel show i'm not gonna lie or as part of a regular podcast thing it actually be quite entertaining comes oh well, what we want to do is we want to be the exclusive place for you to finally get that interview that you've always wanted well, i didn't really always want an interview i only wanted the interview because people were talking so negatively about me right so i was promised that this was going to be a fair interview mm -hmm. where I was going to be able to say my piece about all this stuff that people say about me over the years. Mm -hmm. And then after the interview, basically, I was going to get to be a guest on the show. Mm -hmm. That I needed to get through this interview first, but once I did, I could be a, a guest. And mm -hmm. it would be just like everyone else who had been on the show. At that point, mm -hmm. for over a month, people had been guests on the show. No one else had to go through an interview, just me. Okay? Yeah, because your dark so side feel, bro. Why else would people want you to be on there? Come on, man. Why else would they want you to be on it? Come on, be be for real. Be for real for once. Come on, bro. Be for fucking real. This interview, okay? I get paid nothing for this interview, for the record. It's just me giving them over five hours of my time. Come to find out, was this a fair interview? No. All they had done was talk to all of my haters and detractors for, like, weeks. Got uh -huh. all of their negative side of the story. Literally never spoke to a single person about the positive side of things. All they did was research negative shit about me. And so they went into the interview with the mindset that they wanted to get me to confess to all these heinous things that I had done over the years. Wow, that's a great way to approach an interview, isn't it? They lied and told everyone that the next day... I you know what's funny? He wanted the interview. He said the interview was great after it happened. He said the interview went fantastic. Even though his fans told him it went, it was a disaster, he was so delusional, he actually felt he did a good job. He felt he disproved all the rumors. He clarified everything. That would be the one-stop shop where everyone could go get their answers, question, their, their questions answered. And then after the fact, when they started reading out Super Chats and they started engaging with detractors and shit, that's when he changed his mind about it but after the interview right after it he was perfectly fine even when he was there and they asked him hey how did the interview go did you enjoy it he said yes or i think one of the guys was like oh were we too harsh on you were we grilling you too much he's like no 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 it's actually been really really fair he was very 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 encouraged about the interview then obviously when the tone changed around it and he actually started to clock on what was happening that's when he changed his tune but I love how he retcons and basically changes reality to fit his fucking narrative. It's fucking stupid. After the interview, they were going to have a decompression show where they play games. And then they were going to have a follow-up interview with me later. None of that happened. After the interview, instead, they did a, a hit piece on me. Basically for a, a hit piece. Fuck off. He's hip. The hit piece to him is basically having people on there who don't agree with what he says or who question his narrative question how he interprets certain things you call out his bullshit and his lies and hold him accountable that is a hit piece this guy is fucking de deplorable man the whole day they just crapped on me and made all negative references and took in a ton of money as they should of dollars that's that's what anger that's the real anger to him the real anger is that there were people going on side scrollers sending them guys loads of tips because the interview was good we didn't have a lot of hope, us detractors. We didn't have a lot of hope. We were thinking it was going to be a slow, a softball, shitty interview. There was some indication that the main guy, I forgot his name from Side Scrollers, was a bit of a fucking DSP simp. He was having a bit of a freak out. It was making people be worried about the interview. Then the interview came around and those guys knocked it out of the fucking park. And people were relieved. They were like happy. They were like, thank you. Finally, we have an interview where this guy is getting his feet held to the fire. He's getting grilled. He's being made feel uncomfortable. 
unbelievable. He's basically facing the reality of how regular people think about him and shit. And it was great to see him squirm and have that weird squeaky voice that he felt like he had a throat in his, frog in his throat. And obviously be a fucking question by, um, what's his name? By Keemstar as well, that confrontation and a few other people as well. We loved it. That's why people were so gracious and were sending them tips. But it was absolutely killing DSP that he wasn't getting some of that love and some of those tips back at him because he thought that Side Scrolls interview was going to get him more fans. But it did the opposite. He received from my detractors and haters. Not only that day, but they continued to milk this for weeks on <laughs> he end getting months. Milked. It was months. You're later. a low cow. What do you expect, bro? Get me on the show or get onto my content. Get onto he my to content. Me. This he guy is... would not stop. He's so Basically, angry. He saw me as He's a big so cash upset. Cow and he wanted to keep riding those coattails. Now, since Pause. that show, all right, <clears throat> they have basically gotten some notoriety in the conservative political community which is hilarious because when they started the show it, they always said there's not going to be about politics now the only attention they get is when they talk about politics so what bro right so what they're pivoting their content what's wrong with him he gets so upset when people do different things to try to engage an audience or to try to find an audience or to grow in his head, everybody should just do the same thing they did when they started. So Side Scroller should be exactly the same show that it was when he was first listening to it, when he was fucking 21 or whatever how old he was. Like, people can change. People can adapt. People can, you know, whatever, correct course to basically keep the lights on, to make sure they find an audience, whatever it may be. That's not a bad thing. Not everybody has the luxury of doing the same thing for fucking 15 plus years. Like, fucking LDSP political show that's their show now um all bolstered by when i was on it and by, by the way my interview continues to be the most watched thing they've ever done the funny part about it is the interview never actually did anything in the realm of what i wanted the whole point of the interview that i wanted to do was that people who don't know about me can watch the interview learn and then there's no questions anymore about that stuff in the end all that interview ever did was it went around my detractor circles. That's it. It didn't actually hit mainstream. No one really cared about that interview outside of the detractors. So it didn't really get to serve the purpose. But I'll say this. At the very least, basically all the bullshit about those those negative things, those questions, those accusations, the conspiracies, it all went away. If you don't notice, no one... <laughs> no, really it, no, it it. no, it never. No, it never. You just stopped answering them. The questions never go away. The accusations never go away. The reality of it never goes away. You just ban everybody that objects objects to your narrative or questions you or pushes back slightly. That's what he does. He runs an act like it's actually North Korea at fucking DSP's stream in DSP stream chat. There is no dissenting voices. There is no people questioning him. There is no, um, you know, grilling. There's nothing whatsoever. If you have any objection, even if it's just him stating a fact or him an opinion about a game and you have an opposing opinion, if you say it too forthrightly, you could get banned. He doesn't like anybody saying anything the opposite to him. Yet all attention has to be on DSP and you have to agree with everything he says. It's absolutely heinous. That's why he doesn't see or hear it. And obviously he buries his head in the sand also. My stream and talks about it anymore because I've already said my piece and I'm not <laughs> wasting time anymore with that shit. I'm done with it. I told you guys I'm done with those topics. We're okay, get to with, get right? to the mic clump stuff. Come on, get to the mic clump stuff. Hurry up. So after that, I made it my philosophy to stay out of drama. And okay. I said, I'm not going to be doing any interviews. Great. I'm not going to be doing any kind of anything with anyone. Even uh -huh. though people did reach out to me, oh, I want to interview Phil and this or that. Even. What's this or that? Mudahar or whatever. He Mudahar. Said, oh, I'm going to pay you $5,000 for an interview. And I said, I don't want your money. I'll do an interview, but we're not talking about this drama. I've already addressed it. All the conspiracies are just that. I'm not wasting my time. If you want to have an intelligent discussion about interesting topics. Intelligent discussion. Bro, you're not actually intelligent. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're actually not. You're not that interesting. As a person, really, the interesting thing about you is how you've been able to get away with being who you are for 15 plus years, for the most part. That's what's the most interesting thing about you. You're an absolute freak. No one can figure it out. Like, how is it possible that someone like this exists and has a fan base? That's the most interesting part about you. No one really cares about your opinions and stuff. That's the problem with it. Because, and it's partly his fault. Because he's ostracized himself or he's, you know, placed himself in a bubble and he's withdrawn from any contact with human beings. You know, why, why would you want to listen to him 
you know, with any, about anything else. He has no idea about the world outside of, you know, of, of the world outside of his snort fort. Like, literally nothing whatsoever. Even though he's fucking 41 years old, he is really an infant when it comes to his mind and how he thinks about things. So, you're not that interesting, unfortunately, DSP. The moment you bring up drama, I'm gone. And then he goes to me and I'm never gone. contacted me ever again. Because all these people want is drama. They don't actually Duh. talk about facts like fucking... Why well, else do they want to talk to you? All Come on, is man. Milk drama so this they guy can is money awful. On YouTube. They're all fucking greedy. So anyway, I stayed out of it. Completely, 100%. And uh -huh. I didn't address any more of this bullshit for the rest uh -huh. of 2023. And things went smoothly. However, there were still people who tried to pull me in. Right? These idiots trying to get me to go on a fucking podcast that I never was never involved in whatsoever. And they lied about that and tried to make shit up and talking shit about me. People making documentaries about me. Right? Which is hilarious. The whole term documentary is hilarious. Because if all you do is research shit that's already on the internet. And you regurgitate it into a two-hour video. And all you do is add a little bit of commentary. That's not a documentary. Yes, it is. That's a definition of a documentary. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean the documentary isn't valid. You cannot like it. You're allowed not to like the documentaries. You're allowed to think they're reductive. You're allowed to think they're redundant. You're allowed to think they're repetitive. You're allowed to think they're fucking surface level. You're allowed to think that. But they're documentaries, bro. They're still... That's what a documentary is. How else are they meant to gather information about you if it's not through researching little tidbits that are just out there and adding their commentary? <laughs> that's the fucking definition of a documentary you fucking idiot oh this he's a legend <laughs> you've done everyone else did work for you all you did was regurgitate the, co the toxicity and the and the conspiracy you added really nothing besides a little bit of commentary on top that's not a documentary it doesn't even add anything all it does is kind of summarize all the negative shit people have said so with all that going on, right, people come, oh, well, you, will you do an interview with the guy who did the documentary and this or that? And ultimately, I said, no, I'm not doing any of that, yes, right? I'm staying out. And the funny part yes, is, yeah. someone actually asked me a question last year, and it resonated with me. They said, you know, Phil, all these people on the internet are constantly talking negatively about you. Any of these people... Because you're, a neg because you're a negative person. You were once referred to as the king of hate. You actually, em you know, embrace that name, and all of your fucking content was you know, around hate. You rant and you moan about everything. You complain, you bitch, you cry when you play Street Fighter. You wrangle your fucking audience and stuff. You are a pretty hate-filled person. There is not a lot of good things about you, really. I don't know why he's so surprised that people talk negatively about him when he's quite a negative person. <laughs> his, his lack of self-awareness is fucking frightening, but that's one of the key tenets of being a real prime champions league worthy fucking locale is having world-class levels of fucking lacking of self-awareness it's absolutely one of the tenets of it actually like reach out to you to talk to you right did uh -huh. they ever go to you for information or to get your side of the story no and i answered very honestly no not why would once. they why would all they this time, why would I've they been on YouTube and all the negative videos and the documentaries and everything done not once has anyone ever made a legit effort to get my actual side of anything? Instead, it's always we believe all the time. But you always lie, though. What's the point of asking you if you're going to lie? He lied to the side-scroller's face and said the WWE Champions thing wasn't him. He said the bank leaks weren't his. Can you imagine? The bank leaks that were obtained through fucking social engineering that were pretty clear that they were his because of all the things, because again, he shares too much anyway. He talks too much. So you were able to fucking look back at his streams and be able to link when he mentioned eating a certain thing, when he mentioned going to a certain place, you could see them listed on his fucking bank records, which obviously also showed that he spends way more money than he should do playing fucking WWE champions. But then he goes to his fans and begs and pleads them for money to pay for his groceries to pay for his bill and to take his fucking horse of a wife out for dinner every single week when he makes more than enough money to do all those things he lives in the house with one person who works part-time and a fucking cat yet he thinks he needs double he needs two hundred thousand a year to fucking survive it's absolutely crazy he manipulates and takes advantage of his fan base and lies to them and feigns fucking feigns poverty to extract as much money as he wants from them and the bank records show that and he lied to the side scroller's face 
And he said, nah, that's not mine. Bro, who else is it? You think somebody's running deep cover and has been trying to frame you for what? Years upon years and build up an entire banking credit, you know, banking records that really mirror your real life. Is that what somebody done? Really? Is that what you're trying to make people believe? So people don't bother asking him questions because he always lies. That's the problem with it. He doesn't like answering questions anyway. He bans you if you have an opposing opinion. And if you ask him a question, he's going to lie. What's the point of talking to him? Toxic shit and just report the toxic shit and that's it. Even the side scrollers interview, which at first seemed like it was going to be neutral, was revealed to be an actual attempt to get me to basically fess up to shit I It wasn't an attempt. It wasn't a neutral interview. They both went, they, they went into it for help, wanting to help you clear the air. Part of clearing the air is admitting your wrongdoings. DSP didn't want to admit his wrongdoings. He didn't even want to admit the begging thing was a bad thing. He thought it was a necessary evil. To him, he thinks begging fans for tips and donations is actually perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with begging your fans. There's nothing wrong. He actually thinks it's actually more honorable to beg your fans for tips and donations than it is to accept sponsorships and, you know, from, from companies. Like, he thinks the burden should be always placed on the fans to support him because I'm a crowdfunded individual. It's like, come on, bro. I didn't do for their own purposes. They yeah, yeah, to yeah. To, oh, my God, look, we did it. We got Dark Side Phil to spill the beans on everything, and now we can be notable because of it, and it didn't work. Because it's not. The shit they were trying to get me to do wasn't true to begin with, so obviously it never was going to work. These people were fucked up, all right? So basically, I stayed out of all of this all year but all right all right always in the back of my head I'm, I'm always wondering and i've told you guys this too i don't think anyone's ever going to give me a fair shake on the internet i just don't believe it it seems like everyone is out for the drama everyone's out for personal gain as they should what's be what's better to completely spin something in a way that makes me look horrible for clickbait you're already horrible dsp you. you're already a or horrible to person actually show me in a fair light i'm not even saying show me in a positive light i'm saying show me in a fair light i want to see if the interview does this let's see because he's talking all this talk but this interview isn't going to go well for him i don't think this documentary is going to do him actually anything well it's not going to do the things that he thinks it's going to do but he's think he thinks it does so I want to see what happens when this documentary... Imagine Mike Klum does a good job of actually having a balanced documentary where he, he tries his best to interview as many people who are pro-DSP as they are anti-DSP. Imagine if he does that. I don't think it's possible to find enough people to kind of, you know, um, balance out all the detractors out there because DSP is a irredeemable piece of shit. But if he's able to find them... I would love to see what DSP says after the fact when people are able to see all the detractors say what they say, all of pro DSP people say what you say, say what they say in support of him, have him defend himself in his own words and then let the, the public decide in the same way they did with the Boogie documentary. The Boogie documentary had all the info, find out information about Boogie. It had him talking about his own experiences and his view on certain things. It had interviews with people that know him and whatnot. And people were able to make up their own impression of Boogie and they reacted to it and did videos and shit. That was a good way to kind of get people to sort of like, you know, see him for what he is, make your own mind up. And for the most part, you know, in, you know, Boogie obviously, you know, contests some information bits and stuff and he's trying to manipulate people with some sort of things. But there is nothing to kind of argue about. The documentary is what it is. It kind of lays you bare. Then it's up to the public to make up their impression. It doesn't even try to like throw out a narrative. It just explains what you explained. So I'm curious to see if people do still surmise at the end of this documentary that DSP is a piece of shit, will he accept it? Will he be okay with it or will he cry and still complain? That's what I'm curious to see. That's what I'm curious to see. To actually have another side of the story, to see what it's actually like from my perspective, to go through this, to live through all of this slander and nonsense that's happening. <laughs> Young old vibes. Is DSP a little person? No, 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 no. He's a regular person. He's actually six foot, weirdly enough. He does have the nasally voice of a, you know, of a, maybe a little person or somebody that would be like Joe Rogan size. But he's actually six foot, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. That's the actual funny thing about him. He's not actually short. Um, 
Big up um, Wooly Dingo as well. Net Watcher says here, yeah, I feel DSP is the type of person who genuinely cannot think until he speaks. Yeah, of course, 100%. But that mostly comes because he's so, um, you know, he's so fucking, he's such a shut-in, you know? He's, he's basically refused to engage with the outside world. He does everything in his power not to talk to other human beings outside of his stream chat. You know, he doesn't have any friends. He doesn't have any colleagues or anything. He doesn't hang out with anybody. He just stays in his snort fort with his wife that's barely there, his cat, and that's it. Do you know what I mean? And that's why he's so, like, warped when it comes to some of the things he speaks about. It's, it's really kind of crazy to watch him speak and to try to, like, make sense of the world or try to interact with regular people it's absolutely funny that's why when you see him on side scrollers it's really interesting because he can't he has this weird he's kind of like tense and his voice is cracking and shit it's just odd he's an odd odd species i swear to god he is happened to me for all these years to just be a guy trying to get by with my community and having a good time and ignoring all the <laughs> having bullshit, a good time yeah and then yeah, having yeah. To hear that constantly this stuff is going on outside right so basically all right I got contacted by someone who is a neutral party, someone who does not stand to benefit by actually portraying me in an incredibly negative way uh -huh. because it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it basically, let me put it this way. If you're someone who wants to actually make real content, if uh -huh. you're not someone who's a drama hound, if you're not someone who is, uh, Again, a keem star, a review tech, someone who all of your content is based on making someone look bad. Uh huh. Right? Uh huh. If you're someone who actually wants to make legit content, then you actually have to be fair, because the what do you have to be fair to make legit content? Again, documentaries should try to be fair, but they don't have to be. What? Why did? What? Why did they owe you that? It's somebody's interpretation of how you act or maybe gathering bits of information and trying to present it in a clear way as possible. But they don't have to do it in your favor. They don't have to do it to be fair to you. Why do they owe you that? The moment that you're not, who else would ever want to work with you again? Yeah, right? I love if, that little I love that little manipulation. If you're not fair to me, no one would want to work with you. Yeah, someone, yeah, if yeah. If you portray someone in an unfair way that makes them look awful, then no one else is ever going to want to work with you either. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. It has to be some way where you're actually being fair to the, the subject matter. All right? So, basically, I was contacted by Mike Klum, Mm -hmm. who recently did a documentary on Boogie. And before everyone freaks out about this, because I know a lot of people saw the Boogie documentary and were like, wow, that documentary was not positive. That documentary was very negative. It shows all the weaknesses of Boogie, all his shortcomings, the fact that he basically pissed his life away, all his money away, that he's a toxic guy who falls into drama and he has all these issues. You're right. But that's what they wanted to do with that documentary. You understand? Okay. That's actually what they wanted to portray in that documentary. That was the whole point. To show that side of his life, which I guess they felt had never been really revealed before. Um, that's exactly what was what they were going for, okay? I was contacted by Mike, and he says, basically, this is fascinating. There's people out there who want to see a documentary about you, but he didn't know that much about me, okay? So, <laughs> by the Mike is playing him like a fiddle as well. He's playing him really well. He's kind of really being nice about him. I swear to God, he's playing him so well. Um, obviously, just to make sure he gets the interview, so fair play to him, but DSP has no idea he's getting played. That's the problem with being a shut-in. You have no social awareness. You have no discernment. So he actually doesn't know he's getting basically manipulated. Like, if anything, Mike Clum is milking him the same way that Tom Dark was trying to milk him. He doesn't realize it, though. <laughs> the way, and just for the record, this was months ago. This was he not doesn't yesterday. realize it, man. This was months oh, ago. Oh, God. Okay, where we actually began talking okay. about scenes about stuff like this. Cool. And basically, through a series of conversations, okay, that I had with this guy. As I explained my story to him, he was basically like, so you're, this is completely different from Boogie. Yo, big up, um, Eddie D. DSP has enough money to pay Mike Clump to at least persuade him into making a puff piece. Um, is that, is that been, is, is that been, um, is that a thing people have been saying? 
that DSP is paying Mike Klum. I don't think so. This guy is very adverse to paying anybody. He doesn't even pay people that make his fucking artwork on his fucking, you know, videos and stuff. His thumbnails, nothing. He doesn't pay for editing. He refuses it. He takes everything for free. Everything he wants, he gets given for free. Or he doesn't He doesn't offer even to pay people. So I don't think DSP would offer Mike Klum money. If anything, Mike Klum knows if he does his documentary to the same level he did the Boogie documentary, it's going to be a fucking banger. It will definitely get more views than Boogie. It will definitely get more views than Boogie. Or it will definitely spawn a whole entire micro universe around it, like content. That's what the Side Scrollers interview did. Maybe the Side Scrollers interview itself didn't get a lot of views, but it did spawn loads of reactions and loads of other bits of chatter and loads of other threads. So that interview will actually do numbers. So I think Mike Club is very aware of that. So if I was him, I'll just put my own money into it because it's very much one of the only opportunities you're going to get to get a lot of of this kind of content out of him, especially in this, you know, he's in this vulnerable state where he wants to rewrite the narrative and all this sort of bullshit. I think, I don't know. I don't think DSP would offer him money. And I think Mike Klum knows there's more money to be got from him just putting it out on him by himself. I think so. Um, I'm not too sure what you guys think. Yeah, it's not even close. My life is nothing like his. I'm not in the situation he's in. You know, my in my opinion, and this is my opinion. You know what I've always loved about DS about low cows? I love that low cows have this superiority complex among each other. They're all messes. All of them every low cow's a mess. Every low cow is almost um as bad as each other. But for some reason, they think they're better than one another. Oh, I'm not as much of a low cow as that guy. It's like a weird thing that low cows have. They have this weird superiority complex where they actually think they are better than others when essentially they're all the same. They're all basically people who, you know, can't get out of their own way. And most people are like willing or actively rooting for their fucking demise. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what most low cows are to people. They're a source of you know, nonstop car crash entertainment. But they actually think they're actually better than what they are. It's a really strange thing. The lack of self-awareness is really shocking with most locales. But I love the little infighting and the little things that they have where DSP's like, oh, because they're both, because Wings and Boogie are two fat dudes, he, he kind of thinks less of them, right? Because they're both morbidly obese. He kind of thinks, oh, yeah, I'm better than them because what? I'm skinny fat. Like, huh? Opinion. Other people can disagree. I feel like, in my, my position is a much better position than his. You know what I mean? <laughs> I feel like I'm a better person than him. Like, honestly, this guy actually thinks he's better than the detractors. He's better than other locales. Like, I'm just amazing. Everything I do is the best. Everything I do is correct. I did nothing wrong. Like him, he's in horrible hell. Financially, he's distraught. He can't make ends meet. He's desperate, which is why he's on things <laughs> like this lol. Aren't you desperate too? You beg for money for fucking tips and shit from your audience. Aren't you desperate too? You refuse to get a real job. You refuse to accept sponsors to kind of, you know, what's that word called? To um, um, offset some of the money that you're trying to make or to make up for the shortfall from your fans. You put all the fucking, you know, onus and responsibility and burden on your fans to essentially support your lifestyle through the charity, through their own charity. Some of them are using their fucking disability checks and shit to pay for you. Uh, some of them are even, you know, out there on the fucking streets and they're fucking keeping your lights and you have no shame about that. Come on, bro. You're desperate too. You beg, you literally tell your fans, hey, I haven't got many tips in an hour. I need this, this, I need this, I need this. It's like, God almighty. You are the you are the living embodiment of desperation yourself, brother. I'll cow show where he's Yo, big up Eddie D. Look at how many gifted memberships he has over seven seven thousand. Um those go that goes to the man's head. Exactly, 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 Eddie D. Getting on his hands and knees and being mistreated by Keemstar to make money. Um He's there's honestly they're honestly all the same there's nothing way there's nothing they're all the same getting on your hands and knees and doing content with keemstar and letting him fucking ragdoll you in public and stuff is just as embarrassing as getting on stream and begging your fans to give you tips to pay for groceries or to pay for cat food to take your wife out for dinner that's as embarrassing as what the those guys are doing with keemstar 
especially when you consider some of those guys hated Kimsa before. It's as embarrassing. There's nothing, you know, there's no degrees of embarrassing there. They're both in the same fucking category of embarrassing. In a real desperate way, right? That's very much not the case, okay, with me. I have a successful business. I enjoy coming to stream with you guys every day. I love what I do for a living. I'm making it happen, right? I'm getting out of a horrible financial position in my life, which happened already, and I'm all, I'm climbing out of it. It's slow progress. No, you're not. You're never coming out of it. This is the thing as well. I love that he dangles that in front of his fans. You're never going to climb out of it. You're never, ever going to climb out of anything. You're still going to be the same loser redact that you are now until the end of time. It's never going to change. He kind of, he kind of needs that anyway for his business he needs to dangle that possibility that it could change but it's never going to change that's why he's here begging all the time he actually doesn't want it to change you're big up austin case appreciate you brother gig up has i got my tax return back so i'm giving you your cut of it because you helped me get through my work days with your content <laughs> big up austin case <laughs> <laughs> tax return hype tax return hype whoa, whoa. yo when i used to get my tax returns my because i don't get them anymore because now my taxes get filed correctly damn it right i, I don't work for startups anymore because when i used to work for startups they'd always file my taxes incorrectly and i wouldn't you know i'd gotta pay too much tax and you get your fucking tax credit and we hit, hit fucking nice but now i work for fucking corporations and shit they file your taxes correctly so i don't get tax credits anymore but when i did used to get them best believe when that fucking tax credit hit my account it went straight to fucking eight balls it went straight to bottles of whiskeys and it went straight to tickets to raves I honestly regret it so much. I regret that I spent so much of that tax return money on drugs, alcohol, and tickets to techno parties. I have nothing to show for it. When really what I should do is what most people do when they get tax returns is that you just put it into your savings straight away. You might take out $100 and fucking pay for some things, but for the most part, you take out the most tax credit and you put it in your savings, right? You might take 10% and use that to maybe go and get a steak dinner, maybe go take out your fucking wife or your girlfriend or take your kids out to a fucking theme park and stuff but he put most of it in savings agostino didn't do that he put all that money into eight balls he put all that money into booze he put all that money into tickets to go to techno parties he put all that money into ubers he put all that money into menthol cigarettes even though i don't smoke even though i can't smoke and even though it causes me fucking massive coughing fits i want to look cool in a smoking area so i'd buy packs of menthol cigarettes i'd have a pocket full of fucking class a's and i'd go outside and i'd be stomping from side to side my face leaking with fucking sweat acting as if i was fucking normal and then and then i'd come back home with hardly any money and be wondering wow how did i spend almost 500 pounds on one night out i'm disgusting i'm deplorable don't follow my example don't follow my example big up austin casey <laughs> but it's definitely progress right my story is basically that even though I've made all of these improvements over the years, and I am not representative of what people make me out to be anymore. Maybe one day, 10, 15 years ago, I was really bad. I was obstinate, I was stubborn, I was stupid, I said and did. You know what's funny? You know what's funny about freak offs? Honestly, you know what's funny? I must be the only, and again, I say this with some level of like regret. I never really had, in my most crazy party era, there was never really anything to do with sex involved. I swear to God, there was nothing really to do with sex involved. And I rarely, if ever, even hooked up with anybody. It was mostly me just being the life of the party. I swear, that was mostly my main fucking thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to go out, I wanted to party, and I wanted to be the life of the fucking party. I wanted to offer everybody drugs. I wanted to offer, I wanted to buy people shots and shit. That was all I was on. It's really odd to say this, but I swear to God, there was never an indication of even hooking up. I just wanted to be the guy in the middle of the group. Like, go Aggie, go Aggie, go, go, go. That's what I wanted to do. That's all I wanted to do. <laughs> it wasn't even about freak offs. I just wanted to be the center of attention. I wanted all eyes on me. I wanted to be Bridezilla. I wanted to be the nightclub Bridezilla. I wanted everybody to come to my party, my wedding, my dance floor. Look at me. Look at me shake my money maker that's what i wanted to do strange 
Honestly, so strange because I was involved in, and again, maybe because I was so smashed, I wouldn't even realize if somebody was giving me signals, anybody, because I wasn't aware. I was just in my own world, like, oots, 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 oots. There was no idea of recognizing who was on what. I was just caught up in my own fucking little world, you know? I swear on my life. It's really strange, really strange to say this, but there was no freak-offs for me But I wish I did have a freak-off. I wish I had more freak-offs when I was out there. Consensual ones, by the way. Consensual freak-offs with of age people. But most of the time, I was just feeling myself, you know? Did awful things, right? <laughs> and I got away with it, basically. <sighs> and now here we are 15 years later, and I'm still able to run a business, albeit a much smaller scale business than what I used to do. But I'm still popular. Business high. I still have a fan base, and people still talk about me, right? For, for, for the wrong reasons, by the way. They don't talk about you for the right reasons, dear. The problem is constant misrepresentation. And you might say, well, I don't get it because you, you already have addressed I don't, everything. I, right. I, don't, I don't get I've it. I've addressed <laughs> all of the bullshit and nonsense out there. However, I addressed it here, right? And no one listens to me when I say it on my own content. No one. Mm. This is me talking to my audience who already, it's like, it's like what do they call it? You're preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. You guys already know the deal, right? The fact is most people don't. There's no central place you can go on the internet for the story of Dark Side Phil. Mm. It's this detractor content, this detractor content, this mm. documentary that's way outdated and has outdated information, this documentary that just regurgitates the detractor conspiracy theories. There's literally nowhere you can go to say, I want to learn about Dark Side Phil. Why does everyone talk about this guy? I don't get it. And get an actual answer that's... Can't they learn it on your own fucking podcast? What are you talking about here, man? What are you talking about here? Fair and makes sense. Okay. And so, after having ta talked to Mike, all right, the idea that we came up with was to do a documentary mm -hmm. that's going to, for the first time ever, and I'm going to say this, likely for the last time ever, cover my actual real story. Me growing up. Okay. What it was like. Okay. Right? How I got into games. You know, boring. What it was like when I was a kid. Asked my parents, you know, what was it like raising Phil and stuff like that. Wow. <laughs> We're going to get Mama Phil and Papa Phil. It's so funny, too, because if I'm not mistaken, isn't DSP's dad like a former Marine or something? DSP's dad's like a former Marine, a very successful guy in his career, and he gave birth to one of the most biggest losers in the world. One utter disappointment he must be to his dad. His dad gave him all the all the tools, every every opportunity to make something of himself, and he ends up being a full time beggar on the internet. Imagine the disappointment. He ends up being one of the most derided, one of the most hated people on the fucking internet, and he begs his dented, um, you know, f fan base for fucking money to pay for his fucking groceries. Imagine how sad you'd be as a father to think that's your kid, and his mum. The one that offered to pay for his fucking honeymoon. He said, no, I have debts to pay. Pay off my debts, please, mummy. Imagine. I would love to actually hear them because they are partly responsible for this monster. They are partly responsible for raising this kid who, or raising this man who is so divorced from reality, who has no concept of kind of being a grown up in any way, shape or form, who acts like a fucking man child but thinks he's an actual adult. I would actually like to hear from them. I'm not going to lie. This might actually be a very fascinating interview, all for the wrong reasons and all not to do with DSP. Right? Um, going through the arcade days, going through the, the Street Fighter days, growing up in arcades and how it became this kind of... Uh, hey, big up my guy, Rodeo Brito. Big up Rodeo Brito. What's going on, my guy? Big up Rodeo Brito. Um, I think you're right there about DSP being Nazis from Wish. You know what has been fascinating for me? when it comes from locales and I'm fascinated by this. This is, this is what I'm fascinated about. Locales for me, since I've discovered locales, Boogie, Wings, DSP for the most part, the ones I kind of stick to with some LTG stuff there. I've been surprised, especially when it comes to Boogie, Wings and DSP. I never knew narcissist could be so, it's, it's weird to say, I didn't know narcissist could be so fat and ugly but have so much self-confidence, if that makes sense. I thought to be a narcissist, you have to kind of accomplish things. You have to be somewhat accomplished and then your 
kind of like success kind of like emboldens you to feel like you shit doesn't stink and that you walk on water. I didn't know it was possible to have losers who are narcissists. That's that's the thing that kind of blew my mind when I started getting into locales. I didn't know that there was such a thing as guys and girls who are losers, who are actual bona fide losers who have narcissistic personality traits. I didn't think that was a thing. I look at DSP, I look at Wings, I look at Boogie, you look at, especially Wings and Boogie, right? Morbidly obese guys who are like 400 plus pounds, who are essentially disgusting individuals in every way possible, but they think so highly of themselves. Like even Wings, Wings honestly thinks he's not a neckbeard. He thinks he doesn't fit into that caricature or the avatar of being a neckbeard. He thinks he's better than neckbeards. He thinks he's somehow uh, better than these guys he speaks about in his chat with anime, you know, avatars and things. That really blew my mind. I was like, wow. I always thought to myself, a narcissist was more so an accomplished individual, a successful person who lets the success get to them, and, you know, makes their head too big so they can't necessarily see any wrongdoing that they do. I didn't know you could be a loser and also be a narcissist. That blew my mind. I swear to God, maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm not that aware, but that was one of the things I was like, wow, you can actually be a beggar like DS you can actually beg people online for money but still think you're a boss still think you're a hell of a businessman still think you're a successful person still think that you're somehow someone that people should be looking up to or something because you beg because you fucking shake your tin can every morning and every fucking evening for people to give you money to pay for your fucking groceries can you imagine the lack of fucking shame uh, how do they say almost fraternity culture and shit talking was encouraged, right? And how that carried encouraged. into my competitive Street Fighter career in the 2000s is how it became an innate part of who I was for a very long time. How eventually, after having a back injury and deciding to quit competitive Street Fighter- A back injury. I love how he talks as if like he was a fucking professional skateboarder or he used to fucking ride BMX. What's this back injury from? Imagine being such a- Imagine being such a fucking shut-in. Imagine being so avoidant of any form of physical exercise or any kind of physical movement that you injure your back to the point where you can't do anything more now. It's sort of like a self-fulfilling injury, right? It's sort of like you do it yourself in the hopes that you don't have to move anymore. But he talks about it as if like he was involved in some sort of fucking armed combat or something. And that's how he suffered his back injury. He suffered his back injury through just being, what? Through being sedentary. He had a sedentary life is what led to his back injury, essentially. And instead of doing what regular people do, when you fucking twist your arm, or you strain yourself, and you actually have to work it out. You actually have to do some stretches. You actually have to move your body, get some motion back in that fucking rot rotary cuff or arm or tendon, whatever. He just said, no, that's it. I'm just going to sit more now. I'm going to stay more still. Like... <laughs> How that turned into a job becoming a YouTuber. Right and how I right. somehow got yeah this popularity that doing voice. content on YouTube that not very many people were doing. Right, the improv commentary style. Improv um, commentary style. What? What is improv commentary style? What is this? Improv commentary style content. You mean like content? <laughs> you mean like commentary? Improv comedy style. Improv comedy style, what is that like code word for like acceptable racism? <laughs> is that what you're trying to say? Making it popular, right? I was the innovator of the video game <laughs> back in the day. I was. But look at this <laughs> innovator of the video game. <laughs> honestly, the ego. I wish I had this level of an ego. I wish I could honestly look at my content and say, I'm an innovator. I am the reason why people sit in front of a, a webcam and play video games. It's like, what? No, you're not. And even if you are, you do it terribly. Everybody has taken what you've done and they run. They fucking run to the fucking moon and beyond. And you're still stuck on level one as your podcast is fucking named. Like, what? I wouldn't. That's not something to be gloating about. Like, why are you the innovator and you're so far behind everybody else? Like, come on. He he just got a ring light, what, like a couple of years ago? <laughs> like, what? And you got it for free from a fan too or something. Like, come on, brother.